Hello, and welcome to our community forum. I'm Jeremy Sarakin, Assistant Professor of Communication Journalism and Director of the Program in Digital Cultures and Technologies here at St. John Fisher College. The digital humanities is a relatively new field that simply applies technology to the humanities. Such endeavors can include multimodal narratives that combine video, sound, and computer code, or the data mining of classic texts, or even all the works of a particular author, Shakespeare, for example, to look for patterns in phrases and word usage. In fact, there are countless ways to combine technology and the humanities, and our guest, Dave Lester, is an expert at many of them. Dave is a 2007 American Studies graduate of St. John Fisher and has held key roles at several digital humanities research centers, including assistant director at the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. He also was a Crossroads Fellow at the Georgetown University Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship. He was also a co-founder of That Camp an informal and wide-reaching series of unconferences held worldwide that bring together humanists and technologists. Currently, he is a graduate student at the School of Information at the University of California at Berkeley, where he has worked on developing open badges for WordPress and predictive modeling of ratings on Yelp, among many other projects. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, so my first question for you is just for you to tell us generally what is meant by this relatively new field, as I said, the digital humanities. Sure. So you're asking the question, kind of describing it as a field. Uh, within academia, digital humanities has been the use of technology um, in traditional humanities academic disciplines. So um, if you are a literature scholar or a historian um, or you're interested in art or linguistics, using technology to enhance the research um, the dissemination of that knowledge in new ways. Um, outside yeah. of universities, digital humanities has actually been um, a kind of community of practice that not only involves this kind of humanistic inquiry of universities, but also engages cultural heritage organizations like libraries and museums and archives. Um, so digital humanities as a term is actually right. kind of an umbrella term. Um, I like to use that, I like to describe it as kind of big tent digital humanities. That's particularly yeah. what interests me where um, Together, there's a kind of intersection of humanistic inquiry and these interests um, and a variety of different uses of technology across these institutions. Okay, okay. Um, let me ask you something that people, our audience is familiar with, social media. Sure. How does social media play a role uh, in the digital humanities? So one of the really interesting things about digital humanities in particular um, the work that's been happening across right. different types of institutions has been how social media has acted as a bridge to both establish kind of communication and a sense of community among different researchers. Okay. Um, so I, I gave a talk last night where I used the example of the that camp hashtag. I think we may talk about that right. camp later, but hashtags as a way of connecting people has been a really powerful way to create a sense of continuity across a community. So um, if you are you know, working with a team of researchers or colleagues that are kind of geographically co-located, um, you can communicate very easily in real time, but you can also um, stay in touch with people that may be in Europe, other parts of the world. Sure. So it's really kind of been interesting to see how that has evolved, and social media, I think, is continually evolving, but how um, even our sense of identity in terms of what it is that we do can also be stretched in right. some ways by having that close communication with others. Okay. Um, um, one thing you'd mentioned last night at your lecture was that Twitter um, is being archived by the Library of Congress, I believe. Right. Um, what do you think is sort of the purpose of that? Where is that going? Right. So I think social media has proven itself to be very influential in our own culture. And okay. I think in the long term, we're unsure what this really means. Um, one of the challenges is that we're entering this new age of big data right. and how you know, the information that we can capture and archive is expanding exponentially. And these are kind of uncertain times where um, Twitter specifically can be tied to a number of specific kind of historical events already, including okay. uh, protests in the Middle East. Um, also, you know, I've used Twitter personally right. at events like the inauguration. And it's been really interesting how the kind of heightened cultural awareness um, that you could have through kind of even just looking through on a very um, close reading of Twitter and tweets right. to understand what's going on. And I think that the Library of Congress and part of their 
their um, efforts to archive Twitter is in some ways to capture that. They're not, they're not sure necessarily what the value of it will be, if um, how that information will be accessible to researchers or the public in the future. But for now, um, if they don't save it, there's a possibility that right. it will cease to exist in the future. So it's a kind of preemptive move by them. Uh, I mean, so in a way, having all this information is putting more emphasis uh, for historians and political scientists, for sociologists, sort of on audiences or sort of common, the common people, if you will. Like it matters more in sort of that kind of research, would you say? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the interesting kind of changes that's happening, I think, both within the academy but also outside is the kind of shift from not only the humanities to the, the public humanities, which is, okay. um, kind of has a very strong hold in kind of these cultural heritage organizations that I previously right. mentioned. But when we become aware of being, having audiences and, and being a part of a networked community, it changes sometimes the ways that we communicate, um, the, the types of publications that we pursue if we want to post something online versus in a print publication that's behind lock and key. And I think yeah. that as we continually become more aware of audiences and how that's changing, particularly online, um, the modes that we present information, that we share information, will be continu continually change as well. Um, so I guess sort of thinking about how all sort of this information from all these people work, um, you mentioned okay. big data. What are, some of, what are some of the projects that are, that are important now you know, around big data? Sure. So one of the, like I mentioned, one of the challenges of big yeah. data is just that there's so much information. Right. And another challenge is that a lot of the skills that are required for doing large-scale computational analysis are not necessarily native to humanists. And I think yeah. this is... Interesting because it's forcing two things at once. One of them is you see within computer science a lot of interest in humanistic questions and issues, which is right. interesting. Right. You also see yeah. humanists that are trying to move closer in the other direction. And there's this kind right. of, uh, I don't know how it will fall out in the end, but um, there are definite needs around training and other types of skills that are necessary in order to even do this work. Um, I think that what we're starting to see is um, with big data in particular, the use of computational methods like topic modeling to okay. look at if you had a, uh, a corpus of books and you right. wanted to see you know, what are the topics that are mentioned across these books, right. um, kind of easy to use tools to, to interpret and understand that information are really don't exist today. But right. I know that folks are really working on them and, and once that exists, um, I think it'll be much more mainstream within the humanities in particular. But um, we're in the early days. We're in the, right, right, right. right. Um, to what extent um, d d is this going to sort of require that humanists um, sort of learn more about coding versus do you think just people are just going to, who have the different skill, they're just going to be coming to work together? Or sort of a combination? Right. I, I, think, I think there's no single answer. I think particularly as it relates to kind of publication and the humanities, yeah. um, the computer science publication looks very different than the monograph in the right. humanities. Um, and a lot of the technology is changing very quickly, where if you look at the kind of the graduate life cycle of you know, a student, if you're working on a dissertation, right. um, the technology will change in the time that you're in graduate school, maybe two or three times. Right. Um, so almost shorter forms of publication are, in some ways, um, more significant or potentially have more impact and influence Right. on the community. So it's hard, I think, to know exactly how, um, what that will require humanists to learn and not to learn. In some ways, it's kind of dependent on the profession. Okay. And it actually makes sense. I mean, this seems like this field is moving so fast that you sort of have to, you know, research is relevant for a while and then it's not because people have moved on to right. something else. Yeah. And I think it's also relevant uh, as it relates to digital humanities, where similarly, I think that some of the work that's being done is, um, not always, you know, sometimes the, the primary thing that someone's working on, a right. researcher. It may be what they're doing right. in the side to kind of keep current or stay up to date. Right. Um, but there's a sense that, you're right, things are changing fast. Right. And so we somehow need to keep up and there. people right. are trying to figure out how to do that. At the least the way. processes of not everything we're actually studying. Um, yeah. So yeah. one thing sort of related to the idea of things changing is just how all this information is stored. And, you know, I think back in your presentation, you had a picture of five and a quarter inch disks from you know a couple decades ago i guess um and one concern has been that once you you know you put everything in one format i know i have a bunch of you know zip disks that are like I, how do i read them now is putting things on the cloud 
now going to make it so that, okay, well, now we don't have to worry about format so much, everything's just sort of there in digital, or do we still have that issue to deal with, do you think? That issue will, I think, continually exist. Um, and it's actually interesting because a lot of the, as we continue to produce more digital media, I think there's an interest both institutionally to know how do we make sure that we can maintain this material for the future. We know how to save books really well. We've done, we can save books for hundreds of years. Right. Um, it's fairly common for us to not be able to access information if it's, if it's kind of stored in a single medium you know, over 10 years, right? right? You can right. think of the floppy disks. Got, yeah. And how that falls out in the future, I think, is uncertain. A lot, there's a lot of uncertainty about many of these changes. Um, but as a result of these uncertainties, it has pulled li libraries and archives, particularly into the mix of digital humanities. And um, as kind of one of the primary concerns, um, preservation is really on the forefront of a lot of the research that's happening. So what is the kind of life cycle right. of a project? I mentioned books earlier. Books, typically, you get it published. You may have yeah. multiple editions, but it's published and it's done. It's done, right. But if you create a, a digital humanities project, um, there's when, it, when is it done? Right, right, right. What, what, when is it done? And, and once standards change, as formats change, do you continue updating it? Are, are you somehow using emulation or software to produce the same kind of computer system right. to basically try to recreate what it was like to originally use it? Right. Um, I think some of the really interesting research that's out there now is actually related to kind of emulation and, and vintage computing. Yeah. When I was at Maryland, yeah, right. we actually had um, a collection of vintage computers that we would use, not only for um, the study of the objects, the kind of materiality right. of them, right. but also to do um, what you were mentioning earlier, is kind of often boot up old floppy disks right. and drives where people would come in and say, I wrote my dissertation 20 years ago and I can't. Right download a copy of it. Right. Can you help me out? That's very good. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's it's an interesting issue. It's an interesting historical issue. Just not only, you know, what are the ways in which we store it, but how have websites, how have uh, sort of the different projects we've done over the last 20, 30 years, how have they changed so much? When you think of like HyperCard back from the early 90s, you know, and for their time, those were really interesting. And it's still interesting to see, like, you know, what similar sort of patterns have continued on. Absolutely. Um, we also mentioned, in terms of people working together, we talked about the That Camp project. Can you tell us some, something about that? Sure. So That Camp is, a, is short for the Humanities and Technology Camp. It okay. is a, an unconference, which is um, similar to a conference. It brings people together to discuss issues related around a topic. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it's digital humanities. But unlike your average conference, there's no keynote speaker. There are no predefined sessions. Um, Everything is decided on the fly. That's okay. one of the crazy and exciting parts about unconferences, where at that camp, everyone comes to the unconference with an idea of something that they'd like to talk about, and they share that with the community. And then typically, um, on a whiteboard or sometimes on a wall, people scribble down, you know, I'd like to discuss um, you know, online publication, or I'd like to discuss digital mapping, or subjects like that. Right. Um, and people kind of organically will form into groups and will create an ad hoc schedule. It's proven yeah. to actually be a really interesting way of also networking people together. Earlier we sure. talked about Twitter and the role of social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of lightweight, face-to-face -face way of evoking some of the conversations that you may not otherwise have with your colleagues, sometimes in the same building, but sometimes across institutions. Right. Yeah, I think it's really wonderful. I mean, we talk about all sort of the uses of technology, and yet in the end, you know, even though we're working on these projects, it's, it's great that in the end, it's still important for people to come together. That it's still, you know, in a way, there's something efficient or rewarding about that verse versus trying to do it all in, say, Google Hangouts or something, which wouldn't work, which wouldn't be the same thing. Absolutely. So that's kind of cool. And I think particularly as we have more mediated communications right. through social media, through other right. types of, you know, video conferencing, other kind of technology systems, face-to-face -face becomes more important in some ways where being able to touch base and be on the same page as someone. Right. Um, it can be crucial to be able to work together long term. Um, I have many colleagues that I've met through social media or, or communicated with via email before actually meeting in person. It's a right. really interesting phenomenon the first few times it happens. Oh, yeah. But it's almost become commonplace now where um, so much of our communication relies on using technology right. um, that face to face kind of grounds it in a sense of who we're working with and some kind of greater understanding of, of how, they, how people operate. Absolutely, and, it, and so it's also neat about using social media or some sort of uh, 
computational media to meet first is that you almost, you get past the niceties. Like you know each other to some extent, and so in a way you get to sit, just sit down and work right. or really communicate. Um, what are some projects that have sort of emerged out of that? I know a lot of things are just sort of experiments, but if anything, has anything sort of emerged to sort of grow beyond it? Um, beyond? Sort of the that camp itself, like where projects that have sort of have sure. taken on a life? Yeah, so it's been interesting to see how that camp has done a few things. And I actually okay. didn't mention this in my talk last night. Um, that camp began as a single event at George Mason University in 2008. Okay. Um, we did it the next year, and then um, we've created this regional format where there are unconferences across the country and now actually around the world. So you can go to a that camp in Switzerland or in Australia if you want, um, which are really neat kind of how they're geographically dispersed. Okay. But I think one of the really interesting offshoots of that camp has actually been that camp itself, not the regional version, but the kind of thematically organized that camp. Right. So today, or you know, this year, if you were to go to uh, the MLA conference, you could go to the That Camp MLA okay. or the That yeah. Camp um, Association of uh, American Historians. And I think that we've seen That Camp being incorporated into traditional academic conferences okay. in ways that right. have been really surprising to me, but I think also speak to this kind of need for um, really kind of non-hierarchical, very right. loose conversation that sometimes in conference formats can't really accommodate that. Right. So that camp has kind of been the cure to the traditional conference in some ways. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I've seen conferences where they basically have both going on. It's like yep. they know that people don't necessarily want to attend, as you said, the more formal lectures all day. And yeah, it gives a certain amount of flexibility in right. terms of what you do. That's cool. Um, uh, and tell us a little, tell me, tell us a little bit about um, um, Omeka. Sure. So Omeka, um, if you're familiar with WordPress, WordPress okay. is the kind of most popular blogging system online today. Sure. It actually powers a ton of websites on the internet. And what we did with Omeka was tried to create something like WordPress, but for publishing digital archives. Okay. And one of the reasons that we did that was because, and this is part of a large team at George Mason. I was just a member for a few years. It's, it's really continuing as a su successful project now. Um, but one of the realizations that we had was, underlying a lot of digital humanities projects, you have kind of digital or physical objects on some level. Okay. Whether or not you are, um, you know, you do media studies or you are even, you know, doing studying literature and you have a corpus of documents. Um, if you're a historian and you're looking at historical photos, other types of materials, that at the kind of primary level, there's an archive on some level. It okay. may be your, what you're citing in a paper. It may be objects that have been digitized. Um, but Omeka structures um, that content in a way that you can easily present it online. Okay. That's, co that, that's cool. Um, what are some of the, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of them, but what are some of the things people have done specifically with it? Sure. So um, the Newberry Library in Chicago did a great okay. exhibit uh, online using Link Lincoln um, okay. uh, materials, which is really kind of exciting. Um, there are a number of plugins for the software, okay. which add additional functionality, some of them very social. So one of them uh, is called MyOmeka, which allows essentially students to, or any user on the website, to create their own personal collection of digital objects. So I think there are a lot of learning applications of uh, systems like Omeka as well, where mm -hmm. um, you could kind of thematically or in a kind of narrative form organize a set of um, documents that are in an archive to make an argument. Oh, very nice. Okay, very very cool. Um, are, is, it, is it something? Is it mostly sort of grad students working on, or undergrads getting involved with those sorts of projects as well? Um, in terms of creating the sites yes. or using them, creating as well? the sites, yeah, both. Yeah, I think there's there's um, there's a variety. I think. Omeka has been adopted by a lot of institutions, uh, many of them because they have existing projects that they want to put online, and this is an okay. easy system for them. But it's also been incorporated into curriculum, both at a graduate level and an undergraduate level, um, which I think has really been interesting. Because what happens is when you publish something online, right. you have an audience. Right. And, and right. I, think, I think it changes both the level of engagement that students have, but also you know, it's really exciting to see many of these projects continue after students leave the classroom because uh, they're interested in it. That's definitely true, yeah. I, with my students, a lot of the times, I sort of require them to just even use WordPress. Because yeah. you're right, it does sort of change their thinking about it. They know people are going to read it. Right. It sort of has longer lasting value. Right. You know, and that means something. Um, talking about sort of, you know, how students can find achievement in different ways, um, I know you're working with badges with the Mozilla Foundation. Right. You want to tell us that, about that a little bit? 
Sure. So at Mozilla, we're trying to create um, something called Open Badges, okay. uh, which is a system, a kind of infrastructure for sharing digital badges online. Mm. So across many websites on the internet now, it's fairly common to receive a badge as a signifier of accomplishing some kind of skill or some set of tasks online where you've unlocked a badge. Um, sometimes that's as silly as yeah. you know, checking into a place on Foursquare. Uh, you may receive a digital badge for learning a skill on Code Academy or some other right. website. And what we want to do is create a way to easily pull these badges together so that way they're tied to your own identity. They're not necessarily in silos across different websites. Okay. And this potentially could have a really profound impact on how students apply for jobs in the future, where you can, as part of your resume, also show these are the badges and the skills and the experiences that I've had, um, and, and this is what qualifies me uniquely for these positions. So it's a really interesting kind right. of project. It's a technology project, but it's working very closely both with educational institutions, but also a lot of the you know, open educational resources that are out there, the ways that people are learning online today. If this becomes, as this becomes established, how might it sort of change a little bit how universities and colleges function? Or do you think it will? I think it really augments what currently exists. Okay. Um, you know, today, if you get a bachelor's degree, you are one of, depending on what program, you know, tens or hundreds of other students that have a very similar degree. But it's inevitable that even within your own um, bachelor's program, right. students will go and, and have different specializations or interests or passions. And what badges are doing essentially is kind of cultivating lifelong learning where outside of the classroom in particular, um, you will be doing work and you'll be learning things. And so my capturing that almost gives a, a more a broader picture of both okay. what you're capable of and, and what your passions are. Very cool, very cool. Um, could you tell us about some of the other projects you've been working on? Sure, so yeah. I, um, I'm really just interested in the kind of early days of technology and, and tools and, and kind of hacking around. Okay. I have this humanities background, but I also um, am a software engineer as well. Okay. Um, one of the, those technologies I, I mentioned last night is 3D printing, which I haven't had uh, as much time to play with um, as possible, as, as I, as I yeah. wish, but I think it's a really transformative technology to create, essentially out of plastic, um, 3D objects um, that you can it's basically cool. yeah. model in a computer. One of the other things that I've been playing around with are um, called quadricopters. Okay. They are basically a robot that has four motors and it flies around. And you can buy those, if you go to the Brookstone store in the mall, you can yeah. buy a quadricopter there. Um, and they have a camera on the front and a camera on the bottom. And it seems like a toy, which it is a toy. It's, it's marketed that way. Right. But it's also possible to program these. And I think that we're only beginning to think through and imagine the ways that these technologies can really influence the way that we interact with each other, right. and we discover and explore the world. Um, so, so it's something that we're working on as a kind of small research group at Berkeley. We don't have any definitive yeah. uses, but I think that in particular in the next few years, we'll start seeing these, these quadcopters or drones, right. DIY drones, um, really take a stronghold. The FAA has some um, guidelines that they're supposed sure. to come out with next year related to the legality yeah. of flying these in municipalities and things like that. Sure. I mean, you mentioned it might have some effect in journalism. I mean, how might that play out? Do you think? Sure. So one of the amazing things is how is both the range of these of these kind of quadricopters and the type of access that it can give you to hard to reach places. Okay. Um, so I typically just fly mine in the neighborhood park. So okay. you know I, yeah. I, I I'm, I'm seeing that, but I know that it's been there. Matt Waite has the drone journalism lab where they've been doing um, a lot of research related to using drones for journalism in reaching hard to reach places like studying drought and other types of okay. um, uses. I know that drones have been used um, in different parts of the world to take footage of protests. Um, there are lots of, what's interesting is once you right. get to a certain height, you are able to see things that you otherwise would never have seen before. Right. Um, drones have been used, um, even kind of consumer level drones, to study things like pollution and to find other kinds of corruption. So I think right. that there's interesting, um, it's, it's stretching our minds a little bit beyond, Absolutely. you know, where we started with the monograph and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, some of these other digital projects, but it's one of these emergent technologies that I think is really, um, really interesting. And, and like I said, I think that we're still, we're still kind of 
beginning to imagine what we can do with them. Yeah. It's really amazing, especially when you consider like drone has a certain sort of connotation right now. Yeah. And just the idea that it can be used for sort of these academics or for these uh, journalistic purposes. You're right, it really sort of gets people thinking about how can we use technologies in ways we haven't imagined already. Um, to sort of finish up, um, I mentioned right when we began that you're a 2007 uh, uh, graduate of Fisher in American Studies. Right. So I want to ask you, you know, just for our audience out there, how did St. John Fisher prepare you for everything you're doing now, or for some of the things you're doing now? Sure. So I think that an inter interdisciplinary program is really at the heart of both the American Studies curriculum, but also at all the work that I've been doing, right. um, where it's not necessarily, you know, cultural studies and understanding identity politics, um, history. Um, these are all really important ways that we can understand both the culture that we're a part of, which is right. significant, but also um, relating to people. And on a very fundamental level, I see that as one of the, the real strengths and Im importances of an American Studies degree. That 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 kind of understanding of not only ourselves but also our place in a larger community and a larger culture as being significant. Um, I don't think that that camp could have become what it is um, had we not, um, had I not had that kind of background um, going in. I also think that what was helpful when I was here was also ha getting um, a minor in information technology as well. Okay. So I had done some kind of computer programming on the side. I cultivated it a little bit. And once I graduated, I realized that this kind of blending of the two was really something that I wanted to pursue, so I continue with that. Oh, that's great, that's great. Yeah, and certainly, that, I mean, there are a lot more uh, inter interdisciplinary programs now. There's, we have a, a global studies program, we have a new program that I direct in digital cultures and technologies. Sort of, we were joking before you got here, that ah, you would have done it had it existed when you were here. Yeah. Um, we're basically doing just the kind of work you're doing, basically bringing together uh, humanities uh, with technology and seeing that there's just, not only a lot of sort of career opportunities there, but sort of interesting places, interesting places to study, or things to study as well. Absolutely. Right. Um, so what's next for you? What, where do you think, um, what kinds of projects are you hoping to work on in the future? Sure, so I'm, I'm really passionate about, particularly the ways that digital humanities brings in communities. Okay. Um, some of the projects that I mentioned last night and, and that I, um, still, are, we'll mention even this afternoon, include those related to crowdsourcing and pulling in enthusiasts and others in the public to be a part of the conversation related to these projects. So that may mean transcription. There's the Papers of the War Department project uh, at George Mason, where um, in 1800, the War Department right. for the United States burned down. And over, over 100 years, slowly but surely, they recreated this archive, which was then a physical archive, it was scanned at some point and made a digital archive online. And in recent years, they've kind of created this crowdsourcing project that allows the individuals of the public to come and actually help transcribe these handwritten documents. Oh, and wow. it's an interesting project where um, it has this long history. Right. Um, it's gone from physical to digital. And today, it's, it's involving the public in a way where if you're a, a, a historian or, or, or a kind of early American buff, you can you can go on the website and contribute. And I think that's really one of the futures for digital humanities. That sounds great. That sounds good. Well, I thank you so much for coming in. We've learned a lot about digital humanities in the last half hour. And I thank you for watching. And I thank Dave Lester for coming in. And have a good night.